This week, the Cambridges make a bagel, the Sussexes make a donation, and Charles makes an impassioned plea on behalf of the planet. We've forgotten sometimes, I think, that, that we are part of nature. So what we do to the world around us, we are doing totally to ourselves. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Royal Report, everyone. I'm your host, Sharon Carpenter, and it's been another busy week for the Royal Family, so let's get right to the news. Last week, we learned that Harry and Meghan marked the Duke's 36th birthday by making a $130,000 donation to the Campaign for Female Education, or CAMFED, a nonprofit organization that works to eradicate African poverty through the education and empowerment of girls. The Sussexes' contribution matched the funds raised by an online campaign that was collecting money for the charity as a way to honor both Harry and Meghan's birthdays this year. Also last week, William and Kate spent a whirlwind day in London meeting with organizations and businesses that are helping their communities during the COVID-19 crisis. The Cambridges began their day at the London Bridge Job Center where they spoke with customers, staff and employers about the challenges of helping people find work during the pandemic. From there, the royal couple traveled to the London Muslim Center in Whitechapel to meet with volunteers who've been delivering warm meals and medication to the most vulnerable members of their community. William and Kate finished their busy day with a visit to the famous Bagel Bake Brick Lane Bakery to hear about how the shop has been impacted by the pandemic and try their hand at bagel making. They shared this fun video on Instagram set to the Rusted Root song, Send Me On My Way. Take a look. Last Wednesday, Sophie Countess of Wessex became the first member of the royal family to sit for a live sculpting session. Sculptor Francis Siegelman created an intricate bust of Sophie's hair to support the Vision Foundation, which helps blind and visually impaired people gain access to art. The sculpture will be cast in bronze and unveiled next year to celebrate the charity's 100th year. On Friday, according to an official statement in the London Gazette, one of the UK's journals of record, the Queen ordered that disgraced movie mogul Harvey Weinstein be stripped of the commander of the most excellent order of the British Empire, or CBE honor, he was awarded back in 2004. While the removal of official UK honours is rare, according to the UK government, it's possible when the recipient has been deemed to have brought the honour system into disrepute. Buckingham Palace had no further comments. On Saturday, People magazine shared a statement from Meghan in which the Duchess paid tribute to Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who tragically passed Friday evening. In her message, Meghan said that Ginsburg had been a, quote, true inspiration to me since I was a girl and called for people to honor her, remember her, and act for her. On Monday, Charles delivered the virtual keynote speech to kick off Climate Week NYC, which brings together international figures from the private, public, and philanthropic sectors to discuss climate action. The Prince also announced the launch of a new media project that will see content curated by His Royal Highness to, quote, champion inspiring solutions from around the world. Here's a clip. There is a better world out there. We can operate our industries far better. There is real hope, but we've just got to get our act together. And we've got to remember that the natural world is, is, is what sustains us. That same day, we got a special video message from Harry kicking off the virtual Trail Walker Relay 2020, which supports both Oxfam Great Britain and the Gurkha Welfare Trust. During his speech, which was shared by the organization on social media, the Duke recounted his special connection to Gurkhas and their home country of Nepal, including his 2015 visit to the country following a devastating earthquake. Take a look. Buildings, temples, homes, and entire villages had been completely demolished. But it was clear that despite everything the Nepalese faced, their spirit and their resilience never weakened. There was a clear sense of care and compassion for each other. 
But perhaps I'm bearing the lead here because the real headline for Royal Watchers was, of course, Harry's new haircut, which he debuted in the video. I don't know about you, but I am loving the new polished look. And finally, on Tuesday, Kate took part in a video call with representatives and volunteers from organizations who run peer-to-peer -peer support programs in the UK. Following the call, the Duchess traveled to Battersea Park in London to chat with parents about how beneficial those programs have been during the pandemic. All right, it's that time again where we step outside the House of Windsor for royals around the world. Joining us now is our intrepid international tour guide and People Royals reporter Stephanie Petit is with us. Stephanie, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Sharon. I'm ready to talk about some serious girl power. All right, yeah, let's do it. As everyone knows here at the Royal Report, we're almost always talking about the House of Windsor, but there are 29 other reigning monarchs out there and they deserve some airtime too. And we couldn't help but notice that unlike Queen Elizabeth, who has three male heirs in her immediate line of succession, many of the other European royal families will be seeing a woman, as you said, ascend the throne in the coming years. So today, we're going to do a little globe trotting and get to know more about these future queens of Europe. Sound good? Yes, let's do it. All right. So first up, we have Princess Victoria of Sweden. Her father, King Carl XVI Gustav, has held the throne since 1973. So almost 50 years alongside wife, Queen Sylvia. Stephanie, what do we know about Princess Victoria? Princess Victoria is the eldest of King Carl Gustav and Queen Sylvia's three children. But that didn't always mean that someday she would be queen. The 43-year-old wasn't named crown princess until she was almost three years old in 1979, when the act of succession was changed. Sweden's new rules stated that the monarch's oldest child, no matter the sex, would inherit the throne. Therefore, Victoria's younger brother, Prince Carl Philip, did not jump her in the line of succession. When she ascends to the throne, Victoria will be Sweden's fourth ever queen regnant, which is a female monarch equivalent to a king. And it's been a while. There hasn't been a queen regnant in Sweden since 1720. Despite her regal status, Princess Victoria and her husband, Prince Daniel, prioritized being parents to eight-year-old Princess Estelle and four-year-old Prince Oscar. In fact, she provides glimpses into their family life on social media. In a recent Instagram post, Victoria went hiking with her husband, showed her casual side by trading in her tiara and ball gown for a flannel button down and a baseball cap representing the Yankees, God, I love that. Ah, I love that too. And you mentioned our daughter, Princess Estelle. How much have we seen of her? I imagine there's a, a line her parents must walk between letting her be a kid, but at the same time recognizing that she is the future queen. Absolutely. While living a semi-normal life of an eight-year-old, like attending regular school and taking summer vacations with her family, Princess Estelle is, of course, in the public eye. A few times a year, the Swedish royals release portraits of Estelle during milestones like her birthday or her first days of school. Despite her young age, she's already preparing for her future role as queen. Uh, we've seen her first in official engagement when she was just two years old. And sometimes she accompanies her parents on royal outings. Uh, we can already tell she's embracing the role. Like this summer when we saw a photo of her in traditional Swedish costume to honor the country's national day. No doubt she'll have the best example of a queen when she watches her mother take on the job. Okay, now moving south, 2,000 miles to Spain, which is currently ruled by King Philippe VI alongside his wife, Queen Letizia. They have two daughters, the oldest and heir to the throne being 14-year-old Princess Leonor. Uh, so Stephanie, tell us more about the young princess. So absolute primogeniture still rules in Spain. So had the king and queen had a son, he would automatically be the next in line to the throne despite having older sisters. However, Princess Leonor has just one sibling, a younger sister, Princess Sophia. So she'll ascend to the throne after her father and she'll be the first queen regnant since Isabella II in Spain who ruled in the mid 1800s. And just like other teens, she's headed back to school this month. Is that correct? That's right. Leonor started uh, 10th grade. The public saw photos of her heading to school and she's wearing her school uniform. Like schools around the world, there's coronavirus precautions in place. So she wore a face mask and had her temperature taken upon arrival. Unfortunately, she and Sister Sophia are back to homeschooling after a classmate of theirs tested positive for COVID. 
Although the princesses did test negative for the illness, they're quarantining just like the other students, and hopefully they'll be able to safely return to class very soon. Wow. Now, jumping 1,900 miles north to Norway, King Harald V has ruled since 1991, and his son, Crown Prince Haken, is his successor. Haken has two children with his wife, Crown Princess Meta Marit. Their daughter, 16-year-old Princess Ingrid Alexandra, will become the monarch after her father. So, Stephanie, what do we know about this princess? Yeah, Princess Ingrid Alexandra is set to become the country's second female monarch. Interestingly, her father has an older sister, but because of the rules at the time, she was skipped in the line of succession for her brother. Uh, the Constitution of Norway was altered in 1990 to ensure that the oldest child will inherit the crown regardless of sex. Also important to note, Ingrid Alexandra does have an older brother, um, a half-brother. However, Marius is not in the line of succession because he was born to their mother, Princess Metamarit, from a previous relationship. This means that Ingrid Alexandra will likely be the only queen with a living older brother. And it shows how far the royal families have come when it comes to accepting stepchildren and um, as well as gender equality. Uh, so interesting. How often do we see the princess publicly, by the way? Ingrid Alexandra is, of course, in school. She's just a teenager, but she does join her family for special events. Most recently, we saw her dressed in traditional Norwegian clothing to celebrate the confirmation of her younger brother, Prince Fair Magnus, over the summer. All right, well, hopping 1,000 miles south to Belgium, King Philippe has reigned since 2013 with his wife, Queen Mathilde. They have four children, and their oldest daughter, 18-year-old Princess Elizabeth, is the heir apparent. Uh, Stephanie, assuming things go to plan and she takes the throne, she'll actually make history, right? You got it. When she becomes monarch, Princess Elizabeth will be Belgium's first ever queen regnant, as opposed to a queen consort, which is a woman married to the king first ever queen regnant, talked about until recently, males in the royal family were favored for the throne ahead of older sisters. And Stephanie, even at her young age, she's taking steps to prepare to be the queen, correct? Yes, just this fall, Princess Elizabeth started at the military academy in Brussels, following in the footsteps of her father, the king, who also attended the esteemed school. All right, and finally traveling just 130 miles north to the Netherlands, Princess Katerina Amalia will become queen after her father, King Willem Alexander. Uh, Stephanie, tell us more about her. Absolutely. Uh, Princess Katerina Amalia is 16. She has two younger sisters, Princess Alexia and Princess Ariane. We saw new portraits of the entire family this summer. They were color coordinating in blue ensembles during an outdoor photo shoot. Of course, the princess has her father to show her the ropes of being monarch, but she also has a close connection to another future queen that we talked about earlier. Katerina Amalia is the goddaughter of Sweden's Princess Victoria and was a junior bridesmaid at her 2010 wedding, which is fun. Uh, King Willem Alexander previously expressed his desire for his daughter to get to know herself before ascending to the throne. During a 2017 interview, he said, you must get to know yourself through and through. That's what I keep constantly emphasizing with Amalia. Wow, such impressive future leaders. Stephanie, so much fun globe trotting with you as always. Thanks for being here. Thank you. All right, we have to take a short break for the Royal Report. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. Now, a while ago, we interviewed Simon Morgan, a former Royal Protection Officer, about some of the security questions surrounding Harry and Meghan leaving the UK. Today, we're airing the second part of that interview, which covers a whole range of topics, including what it takes to become a Royal Protection Officer, how the 1974 kidnapping attempt on Princess Anne forever changed royal security, and what it was like to work William and Kate's wedding. Enjoy. All right, joining me now, the Director of Operations and Training for the London-based security firm Trojan Consultancy and a former Royal Protection Officer who served proudly from 2007 to 2013, Simon Morgan. Simon, welcome to the show. Hi, Sharon. So good to be able to join you. Great to have you here. Now, why don't we begin with a bit about your background and how you got started in Royal Protection? My background is that of a Metropolitan Police Officer. To ultimately become a Royalty Protection Officer, you have to be a police officer first here in the UK. It's actually a police officer's role, the prerogative 
rests with the police service. Um, it's not a military role, unlike it is in some other countries. Prior to going to royalty protection, I was on a specialist firearms team, um, working the armed response vehicles that cover London 24 hours a day. So dealing with uh, reactive and proactive firearms operations, because here in the UK, our police service is not routinely armed. So we were specialist officers to support our unarmed colleagues dealing with armed criminality. So I was very much working an environment that was at the front end of policing and very much was probably at the at the lower end of society to a certain extent when you're dealing with armed criminality, whether that be your armed bank robber, your drug dealer, or indeed all the way up to armed terrorism. And what would you say makes for a good Royal Protection Officer? What generally are recruiters looking for? Um, they're looking for key attributes. Um, they're looking for your your personality. They're looking for your your softer skill set, your ability to communicate with people, your ability to problem solve and to see problems that are ahead and how you would necessarily solve them. And that you only get that um, level of experience by being a police officer already. So on average, a royalty protection officer would have served somewhere between 10 and 15 years as a police officer already. Now, when we think about protecting the royal family, I would imagine most of us would think first of assassination attempts, but I'm sure there's a lot more going on as well. So what exactly are you protecting the royal family from? With regards to the protection package that works around the royal family, the, the threat that they face is very much multifaceted. So you have very much the, the headline threats around political and religious terrorism that we face at the moment. Um, you also have people who have a single cause issue. Many years ago, we had a, a campaign group called Fathers for Justice who were working um, towards greater rights for um, divorced fathers. They staged several different protests um, in and around Buckingham Palace. So you have lots of different threats. But one of the main threats that I had to deal with in my time was the fixated individual. Um, that individual who believes they are part of the royal family, wishes to be part of the royal family, and are very much fixated with that individual's life. They will sit very much in isolation and they will plan um, their campaign in some cases, which normally stems from a, um, they become a, a letter writer first, then they become an attendee at events. And eventually there is normally a, a critical incident whereby they will have some form of intervention. Um, and those are most probably the, the three widest um, sets of circumstances. One specific incident I wanted to ask you about, the 1974 attempted kidnapping of Princess Anne. As I'm sure you're well aware, Anne, who was only 23 at the time, was returning to Buckingham Palace with her first husband, Captain Mark Phillips, after a charity event when her car was suddenly blocked by another vehicle. The driver, a man by the name of Ian Ball, immediately got out and started shooting. Scary stuff. Here's a look at some of the news coverage from the time. Good evening. There's been an assassination attempt on Princess Anne and Captain Mark Phillips, but they escaped unhurt. The gunman opened fire on their car 200 yards from Buckingham Palace. Their private detective, their chauffeur and a policeman on point duty were wounded in the shooting. So was a man who was walking past. As I understand it, the driver and Princess Anne's bodyguard were hurt. Then a policeman on point duty ran up. He was turned on by the gunman and shot at at point blank range. With me now is somebody who, who witnessed the whole incident, Miss Sammy Scott. I think they were very brave actually because there was a time when they were completely on their own in this car. There was nobody, no, nobody with them at all. They were completely on their own. And this, this maniac was, was sh rattling the door and, and shooting and trying to get in. And they were right over the other side of the car trying to get away from this gun. You know, it must have been terribly scaring for them, I think. As you just heard, it was originally reported as an assassination attempt. But later it was revealed that Ian Ball had actually been trying to kidnap the princess. And while he'd been ordering out of the car at gunpoint, and now famously replied, not bloody likely, which I absolutely love. So I'm curious, what effect did this have on royal protection? I'm assuming some changes would have been made rather quickly. What took place on that evening? actually saw the creation of the Royalty Protection Department that we see now. Prior to that, it was a very much a different model based on individual protection officers. Now you're looking at whole teams of protection officers. 
you're looking at uh, totally different tactics uh, involving um, certainly how you move uh, the royal family around and certainly how you protect the royal family in residences. So the 1974 incident was very much a watershed in British protection and created the department that um, is now in existence. OK, now looking back, what would you say were some of the most dangerous situations you personally faced? I mean, every every day you step out um, and obviously you're very conscious of, of the threat and what could happen um, during the day. But I think the, the most heightened time within your career was any time doing a royal walkabout. Those were extremely stressful times um, in so much as you're making sure that nothing has happened. You're looking for people's reactions, you're looking for your danger cues, you're looking for how each colleague um, is reacting because um, you're there dealing with the public in a, to a certain extent, semi-controlled environment, not one that's completely controlled. Um, and obviously people do want to see the royal family and some people do become a little bit enthusiastic around the royal family. And therefore you've got to also make sure that your response is tempered to that because um, you know you certainly don't want to cause any embarrassment um, to somebody just because um, they're possibly overawed by meeting the Prince of Wales for the first time. No you definitely don't want to do that and finally I have to ask about William and Kate's wedding what was it like working that day back in 2011? Certainly the um, the wedding of the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge was probably the biggest event biggest single event that I was involved in. Lots of different organisations involved with it from both law enforcement and security services. And certainly many, many moving parts. Um, you know, the, one part was at, at Westminster Abbey. There was a reception back at Buckingham Palace. There was um, time to see um, the couple going to the church and then obviously coming, or rather going to the Abbey and then seeing uh, the couple coming back to Buckingham Palace and then departing. Uh, Buckingham Palace um, at the end as well. So there was lots of times for the public to see um, their Royal Highnesses. But you're also looking at a scenario that those people were on the ground watching, but there were millions of people watching worldwide. And that's where the pressure comes in, because you're looking um, to create a successful operation. That is the that is the main part, make sure everybody's safe. But certainly you're you're very conscious that the world's eyes are on you and you're very conscious of that pressure. Yes, indeed. I believe there are actually two billion people watching that day. I know I was one of them. All right, Simon, thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate your time today. Thanks, Sharon. It was great talking with you. Welcome back. Now, tomorrow, September 24th, happens to be a very important anniversary for the royal family, as you're about to find out. Well, in case you all didn't hear, there has been another royal wedding. The Queen's cousin, Ivor Mountbatten, tied the knot a little more than a week ago to his now husband, James Coyle. On September 22nd, 2018, the British royal family celebrated their first ever same-sex wedding when Lord Ivor Mountbatten married his longtime partner, James Coyle. It's a slightly complicated lineage, but the 56-year-old Lord Ivor is Prince Philip's first cousin once removed and Queen Elizabeth's third cousin also once removed. Two days later, the happy couple posted pictures of the historic event to Lord Ivor's Instagram, along with the cheery caption, Well, we did it finally. It was an amazing day, despite the miserable British weather. All right, Royal Watchers, that's our show for today. Remember to follow people on Twitter to watch the latest episodes of The Royal Report, streaming every Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. I'm Sharon Carpenter. Stay safe, keep calm, and carry on.